Welcome to As Built, the podcast about architecture firms, buildings, and how both get built. I am your host, Brian Jones. My guest today is founder of Brent Buck Architects, Brent Buck. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on today. Look forward to the conversation. Absolutely. In diving into your career a little bit, uh, you started out working for Todd Williams, Billy Chan Associates, um, and how did you know that it was had reached the point that you wanted to to start your own firm? Sure, I think that uh, I worked um, in Todd and Billy's studio for uh, ten years. Nine had changed, but I round up because of the late nights. <laughs> so I'd say ten years totally counts. You know, totally counts. And so I felt like I had a, uh, you know a pretty good handle on the technical side of construction and also the ambition of trying to make architecture um, and a framework that I could open my own practice and um and a really uh wasn't completely intentional but an opportunity presented itself and um i had actually taken a sabbatical from their office this opportunity coincided with that and so it was a very organic process i would almost say not predetermined so from those early days um what were the, the sort of new things that came into focus uh, that weren't necessarily part of the architectural training Sure, uh, everything. But I think I think that uh, you know we focus so much on design and uh, and about architecture with a capital A, both in in a practice like Todd Williams and Billichens, but also uh, in my school training and my ambitions as an architect. And, and very quickly, you realize that so much about getting a building built or a bathroom built or a townhouse renovation built or whatever the problem um, of the day may be, isn't just about your ability to make wonderful designs or wonderful sketches. Uh, it's about communicating and trying to understand the financial aspect of architecture, both from your client's perspective, but from your own. Um, and I would say that we aren't necessarily trained, uh, at least some of us, in the business aspects of uh, building a practice. And um, the work should speak for itself. And organically a firm will grow um and i think that, uh the best advice i was given uh when i left todd and billy's office was to um you know whatever that challenge is that you're given to do that to the to the best of your ability and put all of yourself into it and if you are successful in whatever that challenge is and in my case it was a really small challenge you know kitchens and bathrooms um then then you'll get a living room to to design and then you'll get a house to design and then you'll get you know, a bigger building to design, and then you'll get half a city block to design. Uh, and I think that we've tried to, you know, follow that, that general um, advice, which is uh, to apply ourselves to those problems um, as they come up and do the best that we can. But I would say to answer your question directly, the business side of architecture is certainly something that we're continuing to learn about as a studio and every project is unique. Um, we're doing interiors work now. And so that's a whole nother animal that yeah. um, we, we're not fully trained to do that uh, from the academic side of things. And so there's, there's a lot of organization and billing and um, there's a large process around all of these things, which I don't think that there's a manual out there that says this is the one way to do that. And so we, we figure it out. So you share a lot of the completed work and the works in progress on social media. Has that had any impact on the kinds of clients that you work with or how those clients communicate with you? Um, I would say that it wasn't intentional uh, from day one to not have a website and we're building out a website, but the work kept coming mostly because of how we interacted on social media. And one of the things about architecture, which has always been inspiring to me, is process. And so showing up to a job site and all of the... Um, the issues that you're dealing with when you show up and uh, negotiations that occur between the architect and the builder and the subcontractors and the client um, and all those compromises are an equal part of my interest in the field of architecture and trying to get something built. And so we use social media as a vehicle to pull back the curtain a little bit, not all the way, but pull it back in a way that um, people could, get, could engage with us um, uh, in that way. And so the types of clients that we see in our practice are people, one of my clients said, Brent, you get complicated jobs. And I always feel like, yes, the phone calls we get are never like, here's this perfect site with this incredible view and here's this unlimited budget. Um, 
you know, we, we, we tackle complicated projects um, and New York City is, is ripe with them for sure. But I think that social media has drawn in people into our practice that are curious about process, want to understand um, generally how things get made, who makes them, you know, whose hands are touching what, um, how much to get involved, how little to be involved in certain things. And um, so that means that there's a huge educational component to our role as architects uh, in, in the process with, um, with clients. Do they use those posts as talking points in discussion with you, or do they become part of the fabric of the project as you're, as it unfolds? I would say our clients generally uh, don't discuss those posts with me. In fact, um, I don't actually think it's ever come up. And um, I, at the beginning of each project, uh, everyone that has hired us understands that we have a social media account and, and everybody has a social media account, it seems like. Um, and that generally we are asking for permission to post in process things. Um, and there are caveats to that, which are, we're not identifying the building or location uh, or address. We're not identifying who our clients are or um, intentionally trying to remove any identifying marks um, from those images. And uh, as long as we stay within those rules, we, we haven't had any real discussions about social media presence or how people are engaging in it. I think that our clients, uh, though they've never suggested it, I think that they enjoy watching people interact or what the questions are that people are engaging us with. Um, I have to imagine that there's some level of interest in that. And there are also clients which have told us um, we're doing substantial projects where we're not posting on social media about them. And, you know, we are honoring those requests from those clients. Um, and, uh, I think it's also an interesting way that a client in some, in some capacity checks in with what, what, what we're working on at any one moment, like all of those things. And, and the truth is we're on those job sites probably way too much, but, um, you ask our builder, but uh, anyway, we enjoy that part of it. So, so as your practice has grown, you've gotten commissions outside of New York City. How has working outside the city and other parts of the U.S. impacted your practice? Yeah, I think that New York City is a complicated place to make things. Um, I, think, I think you could say that about anywhere, but there are significant bureaucratic challenges in the city of New York. Um, I think our client base in New York has a very high design uh, ambition and knowledge base. So when they come to us, they, they know who this architect is and they know who this designer is and they, they know these references, you know, it's, it's not uncommon that someone says, oh, he, I, I went to, to, um, the Brion cemetery, you know, from Carl Scarpa and you're like, what, you know, and Hey, and I was inspired by, you know, and so those are, um, people in New York city that are curious about not just architecture from such a utilitarian perspective, but from an experiential perspective. And so when we work outside the city, I think the people who are calling us share that interest in design. Um, and when we are going to say, whether it's in Iowa or it's in Connecticut or it's in Pennsylvania, or, you know, we've gotten uh, job opportunities in many states. And I would say that um, those opportunities uh, present themselves and have their unique challenges, but but New York City has prepared us to be able to ask those questions, to smile, to get, receive the bad news, to talk to the inspector, to talk to the plan examiner, to talk to the local code official, to get the project approved. And we also see that builders outside of New York are different than builders within New York City uh, to a large degree. Um, they're, they're very different in terms of their organization. They're different in terms of their approach. Projects unfold differently. Um, they're sequenced differently. And I think that it is a great joy sometimes to work outside New York City because I feel like oftentimes those projects have an opportunity to be a little bit more step by step and potentially a little bit more linear. Um, and so uh, it is uh, in terms of managing those jobs um, from afar, sometimes it's, it's actually easier because the builder doesn't know that they can just say, Britt, there's a problem on our job site. Can you get over here right now? And they know I'm less than 30 minutes away. Sure. Um, and so, but that's a team effort. Like that's not a bother on us. But there's also a joy in um, either someone just calling us and say like, Here, here's what we're working on, like what I think, or um, it also forces us to just sit in our chair a little bit more and uh, 
you know, act very professionally through, you know, pro core or through a submittal process, uh, sometimes can break down in some of our more, I wouldn't call them exactly design build, but, but certainly some of our Brooklyn projects, um, wind up having that type of feel and relationship. So as your firm has grown, so have the scale of the projects, um, was that a conscious choice to seek that size of work? I would say just like opening our studio, it's been an organic process that we are trying to take on work that we haven't done before so that the challenge is new, that um, some of our first projects were townhouse related work in New York City, and there's quite a bit of townhouse work. And so I've, I have felt that some architects do townhouse work and that's what they do. They are townhouse architects. And I think that architecture is a patient process and also a long journey. And so I have a very long outlook on our career and our studio. And so what I don't want to have happen is to do the same project five or six or seven or 10 times. While it's fun to refine those things, I think that that's going to become a little bit stale for us and for myself and for the staff, um, you know, the people we collaborate with every day. And so it has been an organic process of getting phone calls, um, interviewing clients and having them interview us, understand what their ambitions are for a project. And um, it's always, uh, it's a back and forth interview process. And then I would say, you know, if a project is, a, is something that we haven't completed before or a problem that we haven't tried to solve, that's significantly more interesting to me as an architect to try to say yes to that project and dedicate what it becomes years of your life to trying to solve that problem um, alongside your client and builder and, and everyone else. So the, the scale of the work has grown and um, there is a joy in that. There's also uh, a nerve wracking quality to it that it becomes more public. Um, last At the end of last week, a website, there were people outside of one of our projects photographing like, installs of structure and then blogged about it. And I got emails from anyway, all over the world for frankly saying, hey, I see this project. And, um, and that's, that's both exciting and it's also terrifying. And it means that, you know, we have to be on our best behavior and we have to, um, you know, we have to dot our I's and cross our T's as best we can and, you know, on behalf of our clients. So that specific project, the city of New York. So. so speaking of large projects, you have been working on a heavy timber project in Brooklyn. Can you talk a bit about the process of getting a project like that approved and the journey of bringing that? To, to reality because it's underway. Yeah, sure. It's um, uh, the project is topped out. And so the structure has been fully installed, uh, which, which is phenomenal. And the installation of all the mass timber elements came together, uh, I would say from my perspective, very smoothly. So it was a, a success in that regard. Uh, the, the approval process, first of all, there's client buy-in uh, to a concept of a mass timber building. Fortunately for us, our clients were all in on mass timber. And so um, it was going to be a mass timber building from the beginning. They generally understood the risks that um, they were taking in trying to accomplish a mass timber building in New York City. And when we started the design process of that building, mass timber, CLT specifically, I should say, was not legal in New York City. Uh, it was legalized, no I believe it was November 8th of last year. And so our process was an interesting journey that we pushed the Department of Buildings to approve our foundation. And our client took a huge leap of faith um, and said, let's move forward and install the foundation before the mass timber bits could be approved. And so a bucket went in the ground. There was demolition of the one-story existing garage. Um, the foundation was, was installed and we had one objection left um, on, our, uh, on our filing with the city of New York, which was wait for the new building code to be enacted. And so as soon as that was uh, enacted, we were able to get our permits for, for the building itself, for the new building. And um, it was an interesting process because we had all this stuff lined up. We had all the, the CLT mass timber shop drawings approved. We were, were just going to press go as soon as this became legal. And so it was this amazing experience of being able to be at the front of whatever that wave becomes, hopefully in Brooklyn and New York City. Um, and hopefully help set some precedent in terms of how these types of projects can be delivered in New York. But uh, kudos to our client who is an incredibly forward-thinking um, husband and wife duo and, and the, the, our client rep team at CV Partners uh, to be able to execute something like in the city. is truly uh, 
it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for it. That's great. How has, I mean, from this project uh, has a huge sustainability component to it, but how has the idea of sustainability been implemented into your practice and how do you find that, you know, impacting your practice? Yeah, I think that um, I've always been interested in uh, in sustainability and uh, in wood as a material. You'll find that theme throughout most of our projects, also reclaimed wood. And I've also been a believer that I don't think a green building or a sustainable building or reclaimed wood has to look like a side of a barn. Um, it can be modern and it can be clean and it doesn't have to have this, uh, you know, ruggedness to it, I guess. And I think that uh, while that aesthetic may work for some projects, uh, certainly in New York City, that's not what we have been trying to accomplish. And so there is an interest, but there not, there's not an interest to put a billboard on the front of our projects to say, this is a sustainable building. This is a, this is a green building. Uh, we want to make sure that those, those core values are baked into all of our projects, but like not having a website, I'm not jumping up and down trying to say like, here I am. I'm not jumping up and down trying to say, this is trying to be built to a passive house standard. I want to say that those types of sustainable ideas should be inherent in all the work that we do. And, um, ideally, uh, all the work most architects do. And it's really our job as architects or part of our jobs to educate our clients in terms of what those opportunities are, push those types of, I'm not going to call it an agenda, but an idea, um, whether it's passive house or just making a tight envelope or buying more efficient windows, but presenting them with those types of options that they probably heard about and they're probably on their mind, but at the same time, um, yes, they cost more. So what are the trade-offs of that? And uh, yes, we can install this window or that window. This window costs 10% more, but it, yeah, it's twice as energy efficient. So what does that mean for you in terms of your comfort in the way that you will inhabit this building? Um, and those are the types of conversations that we look forward to, to continuing to have with our clients. But um, I, I, it's a funny thing because I have that ambition to be sustainable as an architect. Uh, building is inherently not sustainable um, as a practice. We do have an, in, you know, we do have an imprint uh, on our neighborhoods and our and our and our world, and I think it's important for us to always be considerate of those issues. Well, I really want to thank you. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I want to thank you again for taking time out of your schedule, uh, which is a very busy one, to share your insights with me and with our listeners. Um, until next time, this has been As Built. <laughs>